we have a really interesting discussion ahead of us. I've talked to each of these people by phone, and I know a little bit about what they're going to say. And uh, I, I think that we will all have something to take home with us tonight. Um, to our work, to our families, to our communities. So let me introduce our guests very first. Uh, first of all, directly to my left is Tisha Fiddler. Fiddler is Anishinaabe from the Kitchenamegu Zip in Anuag and Onegaming, First Nation in Northern Ontario. Thank you for your coaching. She's a mother of two daughters, aged 12 and 17. Tisa is, is the Indigenous Education Resource Teacher for the Thunder Bay Catholic District School Board. She's been involved in education for 20 years, working primarily with First Nations students and their families. And she served as a board member for the Thunder Bay Aboriginal Head Start for 10 years. And she's currently on the Parent Council for the Children's Centre Thunder Bay. Paul Cormier is a member of the Red Rock Indian Band. He holds his Bachelor of Education from McGill University, a Master of Arts in Conflict Analysis and Management from Royal Rhodes University, and a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of Manitoba. He's worked with Aboriginal groups across Canada and in child welfare, and he's interested in promoting an Aboriginal worldview. And Paul uh, is a faculty member in Aboriginal education at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. And beside Paul, is Zina Alhamdan. She's the programs manager at the Arab Community Center of Toronto. Zina was born in Iraq and came to Canada as a refugee over 15 years ago after 10 years of displacement across the Middle East. She has more than a decade of experience in the newcomer settlement services sector, starting as a frontline settlement counselor with a focus on serving refugees and providing in-depth and crisis counseling. And she transitioned to program coordination and volunteer management, and she's been in her current role as a program manager for the last five years. And way down there at the end is Nora Spinks. And we've got a long line here. Uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Vanier Institute of the Family, which is based in Ottawa. Nora has spent more than 25 years engaging organizations from many sectors, as well as business, labor, government, and community leaders across Canada, to, uh, brought, uh, to strengthen families, create productive and supportive work environments, and build healthy communities. She's assisted in the development of a variety of federal, provincial, community, and corporate programs that focus on employee health and well-being, and family care, and workplace flexibility, and work-life harmony. So welcome to all of you. It's so good to have you all here. Some of you have traveled from Ottawa and Thunder Bay and Zena lives right around the corner. <laughs> so thank you. So I'm going to ask each of you first to just give us a, a, a brief uh, sort of idea of where you come from. So what's what you know something about your work and what you think about family and inclusion which is the topic for tonight. Okay so Nora let's I'll start with you at the end. Can you tell us a little bit about the Vanier and how it studies families? Sure. Um, and I'm going to show you some slides too because I'm going to give you an overview of families in Canada the way we see it from the Vanier Institute. So we're um, established 50 years ago. We are a research uh, think and do tank. Um, we look at families in all of their diversity, in all of the ways that families intersect with community and with um, the economy and how the society and economy impact families. Do you want me to do the... Yeah. Um, do you want to just put the slides up? And I'm just going to give you, I'm supposed to give you the overview of families in Canada, so I'm going to do this very quickly, but I'm going to highlight some of the key things that are going to um, provide us with some framework for the conversation that, uh, that we're going to have. So um, let me just ask you a question. If I ask you to complete the phrase, family is, and you've got one word, what would it be? Love. Love. Strength, foundation, foundation. Unity. unity, respect, learning. What we did is we went across the country and we asked different groups of people that very same question. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to identify where the differences were and then find ways to um, really understand those differences. And what we found was there were a whole lot more similarities in the word differences. And love was clearly across whether it was seniors, newcomers, indigenous communities, um, families affected by incarceration, kids in care, um, you name it, we covered it. From kindergartens to post-secondary, from low income to high income, um, and this is their respective word clouds. And if you mush them all together, uh, really, family is love, care, and support. It's about connections. 
Wow. The difference is we did find we're more generational. So family is annoying, um, frustrating. Uh, you know we're adolescents. Um, fa family is expensive. You know those are new parents. Um, Dysfunctional. Family is legacy. You know we're seniors. So when we talk about family, we really, we're not talking about structures, we're talking about uh, relationships. I wanna just give you a sense of uh, the population because we're gonna be talking about indigenous communities and people new to Canada, but just to give you a frame of where Canada is and was, um, 1921, and then just before the World Wars, or just after the World Wars, and then we get um, the baby boom that everybody talks about. Now, the baby boomers are turning 65 at a rate of one every seven seconds in North America. Um, wow. And so 2011, that's them at the top. And then we get the next, um, uh, the trailing boomers. Then Gen X is the next peak. And then millennials are the beginning of that dip. And then that big dip coming up, those are the ones who are going to be looking after all of us. Wow. And they're going to be supplemented and supported by immigrants. And they're the ones that... When you look at the forecasting, it actually is going to shrink down to look more like a, tr a rectangle than what everybody's fearful about, which is more like a lollipop. It's actually going to look more like a, a rectangle. Um, so we're all living to be 100. Uh, you have a 91% chance of actually making it over 80 now. Um, Seniors are redefining aging, and wow. <laughs> we have much greater likelihood of having a great grandparent in our lives or being a grandparent for an entire childhood and even into adulthood. Um, next generation is redefining everything about work and the way in which we relate to one another, the way in which we form uh, families. Millennial dads are redefining parenting. Uh, millennial dads are much more active and engaged we used to hear dads talk about my wife is expecting, and then in the, into the late 80s, early 90s, we are expecting. Um, recently, we've been hearing from new dads, we delivered. Um, so they're much more uh, actively involved, whether they're in a relationship with the mom or not, um, they're more involved. Grandparents are redefining grandparenting, that's the, the boomers. Um, a third of first-time grandparents are in the paid labor force uh, when they become grandparents for the first time, and this is a new phenomenon. And so we're now hearing about things like grandparent leave. Um, wow. <laughs> health is critical as we're all lo living longer. We want our health span and our lifespan to be equal. And because the vast majority of the care we receive is from family members, as we each individually self-define that, uh, critical. Um, but it also means that we have the wisdom of elders for a longer period of time. And it, those relationships are solid. We're more likely to live in multi-generational households at least once in our lifetime. Um, and this is particularly true for uh, new immigrant families. You're more likely to live in multi-generational households, but increasingly by choice, but also by design. Um, We've redefined adulthood. It doesn't start now until early 30s. Um, we've created this pre-adulthood, which is now in your 20s, um, changing the dynamic in terms of families. Um, we've redefined motherhood. Um, we used to define mothers as those who stayed home and looked after kids. We're now, you name it, any kind of mother. And you might have heard in the news lately, um, co-mamas where it's two women who have, um, one is a birth mother of a child and another is the best friend of the mother, but there is no intimate relationship, but they've just become legally co-mamas. So we're redefining uh, mothers and motherhood, the same as fathers and fatherhood. Um, dads are more likely to state in the workplace that they're dads and take time off, although not all workplaces have figured that out. Um, you may have two, and in more cases now, three or more adults in the family with step-parents and co-parents. Um, we now have solo parents, and we used to refer to as single parents, but it's not about the marital status anymore. It's about the role that they play. So you may be in a committed relationship. You may live in the same household or not. You may be legally married or not. You may be recognized as a couple or not. 
and you still may have a solo parent that makes most of the decisions, a co-parent or a lead parent where one makes most decisions and the other doesn't. Um, coupling and uncoupling is very different today than it ever has been before. So when we think about families, it's about these relationships, connections, and partnerships, um, as well as uncoupling, uh, conscious uncoupling. If you are going to separate, you're more likely to do it with mediation and with negotiation than with animosity and lawsuits. Um, step family is much more common and much more likely to be involved with um, uh, the previous family. Um, foster families, we're now recognizing StatsCan counted for the first time. We're going to get the second set of numbers in, in August. Skip generation families, those are families where the, the grandparents are the primary caregiver, where there's no parent involved. That parent may be incarcerated, may have passed away, or may live somewhere else in the world. We have people living together apart, so they're together. We're a couple but living in two separate households, or you may be apart as a couple and living in the same household. So Statistics Canada is going crazy trying to figure all this out. <laughs> in fact, in the last census in 2011, they had this data from northern Alberta, and they made the um, declaration that there was a whole bunch of new same-sex couples now um, in northern Alberta. So they thought all these men moving up there were gay, when in fact, they just answered the form, who lives in the household, two men, um, are you married, yes. <laughs> but what they meant was they were married to women back in Cape Breton and, and not to each other. So we've got to figure out how to, how to count and measure this a little bit. More interfaith, more interracial, more debt, more intertwining of family finances. Um, and in fact, there's $760 billion that's going to change generational hands in the next decade. That's a lot of coin, and that's a lot of wealth, and we don't know what that's going to mean. Um, we've got a good focus now in this country, lots more conversation about our, what we can learn from our Indigenous families. Um, they have some of the um, fastest growing population in Canada. Their fertility rates are much higher, and um, they start having them much younger. Um, we have a lot more conversation about gender identity and the way in which we form foundations. Um, we're much more aware of the families that are living with a loved one who might have a disability, and in fact, we all will likely have a period of time where we ourselves are living with disability and uh, being cared for by others. Caregiving is a normal experience. We're all going to be looking after each other. Seniors are helping each other. And I just want to close on this concept. Um, you, some of you have just had a coffee. Um, when you think about historically families in Canada, it was more like coffee was in the 60s. It was black, it was hot, everything was the same. If you had a coffee and it was hot and black, your needs were met, you were satisfied, everybody was happy. Um, and now, think, Tall vanilla latte, double hot, double shot, no foam, soy. More choice, more diversity, more interaction, and yet the experience is still exactly the same. It's a bean, it's heat, heated or cooled, but our experience with it now is completely different. Anybody know what this sign is from? Whipped cream, customize and enjoy. This is McDonald's. McDonald's, the inventor of the all beef patty special sauce family meal deal. Everybody gets the same. You can't pickles, onions on a, is now customizing and enjoying. It's a good metaphor for what we need to think about when we talk about families. Not only can you customize your coffee now, you can customize your own sandwich. This is the, the way in which the marketplace is recognizing the diversity of families. The originator of customized coffee, Starbucks now, not only do you customize your coffee, you customize the cup, and not only do you customize the cup, you customize the lid. <laughs> our policies and programs and our conversations about family are now more like this. So just remember that when we're thinking about families, that it's not the strongest species that shall survive, but that which has the greatest capacity to adapt. 
And the more we have these open conversations about different experiences, different perspectives, and not make assumptions about different groups and different people and different experiences, we'll all be much better off. So that's my life in family for the last little while. Okay, thanks so much, Nora. So you really, you really gave us a very good picture of the diversity of families in, in Canada. And one of the things that we want to get to a little bit later is what that means for inclusion. So how does that impact inclusion? And how do we think about inclusion? And is this helpful to think about it this way? So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Zena, so you work with the Arab Community Centre. Can you tell us a little bit about what, how would you describe the families that you work with? Um, the Arab Community Center that I've been working for for the past 10 years, I actually, my interaction has been a little bit longer than that with the Arab Community <coughs> Center. Um, it's been there for a little less than the Vanier Institute, 45 years, and we've mainly focused on serving newcomers. And newcomers um, by self-identification doesn't mean that you're within the last five years here, but you self-identify as a newcomer to this, to this country. Um, the average population, average client base that we serve is about 5,000 clients a year. So it gives you a little bit of understanding of, of the reach of how many newcomers we serve. The majority of the clients we serve come from um, Arabic-speaking countries. However, we serve um, everybody and anybody. Um, family to anybody who's from the Middle East, and um, correct me if anybody um, disagrees from the Middle East, um, family is everything. It's love and responsibility. Um, it's, not, it's not the nuclear um, Canadian context family. It's not mom and dad and the children. It's the grandparents, it's the cousins, it's the uncles, and sometimes your neighbors. Um, family means um, everything. They're, we're not an individualistic society. Um, we live and survive based on our connections to those around us. Um, the average family we see and we serve, um, the average age of the parents are between mid to late 30s, um, usually minimum of four kids between the ages of zero to 18. It's multi-generational. There is usually an uncle or an aunt who's attached to that family unit. Um, sadly, the population that we have been serving for the last 10 years are um, coming to Canada as refugees because of what's happening in the Middle East. So the average family has lived at least two years in a refugee camp or refugee host country prior to coming to Canada. Uh, prior to that, there is two or three years of, uh, of internal displacement. Uh, there is a lot of um, shifting in family dynamics, shifting in, uh, in the experiences, the experiences of the little one who came to Canada before they actually start speaking and walking is completely different than the ones who had to leave school to support the family. It's different than the teenagers who had to stay at home or take care of the, uh, the uh, parent who's disabled or look after the family. So each person in the family has a completely different experience, more or less, of their migration um, journey. Once coming to Canada, everything should be beautiful and happy. You reach safety and everybody's grateful, but yeah, now you're housed, now you're back to school, you start seeing a lot of challenges, you start um, dealing with all the trauma that you've seen, how you're, how you're accessing all that. All these are challenges. Now there is one big challenge and it's, it speaks to the concept of inclusion. Most people that I see in my daily work um, have never actually lived in a multicultural society. We come from a homogenous population. We all look alike, we all eat alike. Um, more or less our religions are, are practiced the same way. Uh, family is very traditional in the concept that there is mom, that there is dad, um, everybody, um, and the family unit rarely breaks. So coming to a new, um, a new country where all these changing things, it's, it's, a very, it's a very unique experience, but at the same time it's a scary experience for the part of the parents and, and adults, not, not only adults, like anybody over 13, 12, who's aware of what family is. So one of the f challenges that we see a lot is interaction in schools. Not because of only the language barrier, going back to um, 
to school where you have been out of school for five years. You're learning, you're not understanding your, um, your instructions. You're not understanding the rules and regulations, the communication, the, un the unwritten rules. It's not only that, it's also how do I fit in? How do I actively participate? Where are my limits and how do I interact, but at the same time stay safe and not cross my boundaries? A lot of, a lot of the children that we deal with end up in, um, tangled with the system, not because of anything but lack of knowledge of how the system works. And, and it, it creates this othering narrative where the parents automatically feel isolated. Let's not interact, let's not make a mistake. Okay, for us um, as service provider, providers for the newcomers, for us inclusion means when my uh, service users are um, comfortably able to interact, engage, and um, with, the, with the population around them in a productive manner. Not just let's go to school, come back, hope nothing happens. How do I participate? How do I engage and how do I contribute to this to this mosaic that I'm in right now. Okay, thanks very much, Zina. And there must be some issues around uh, maintaining the family cohesion, yeah. which was strong mm -hmm. when they move here. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we, we, we struggle with is most of the families that we serve have never actually been on their own. There is always the aunts and uncles, and, and even when you're in a refugee camp, um, the people around you who are your neighbors are considered part of your support system. When this support system is removed, this, this is a very, very difficult thing to maneuver because most um, families start at a very young age. What is known now as teenage um, mothers and parents, it's a very normal thing to have 16 and 17 year olds um, or they land in Canada at 19 with two children. So the whole concept of um, I am relying on my extended family to raise my own family, I'm still not fully developed, is, is a very, it's a very big piece of the integration and inclusion. That's one thing. The other thing is if you have older children, you still have the skewed and shifting. It's a very volatile <coughs> family dynamic that you're looking at. Um, if you have lived in, let's say, three, four years of displacement where you weren't allowed to work, only your six to 14 year old can work, these are the breadwinners, these are the ones who are out of school. These are the ones who are being aggressive and protectors of the family. You come back and now you wanna restore your family dynamics. You don't have the same support system. You don't have the same skills to parent. Um, you're not at the same advantage as your children who pick up the language faster than you. So there are all these language, these all challenges. Unfortunately, the last cohort that we've been serving, majority have been with much lower literacy rates than the previous waves that we have seen who had minimum of um, two years of post-secondary education. So all these pieces, but the reality is everybody is grateful to be able to be safe and be able to explore without hostility coming towards you. Okay, thanks, Ina. Paul, uh, so we described your work. Uh, you sort of see the world through a peace and conflict lens and uh, an Aboriginal worldview. How, 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 how does that relate to your idea of family, or what, how do you think about family? Um, okay, so um, I made some notes. I'm not looking at my Facebook family. I'm looking at my notes. Uh, my kids think Facebook is their family, but uh, I don't think so. Eh? Um, yeah, I, 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 um, I'll in introduce myself in a traditional way, and I'll kind of talk, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so, Buju, Mayingan and Dijinakas, Mayingan and Dodum. Mayingan is wolf in Ojibwe, so I'm from the Ojibwe Nation from Northern Ontario. My community is the Red Rock Indian Band, but actually it's Opaganissening is the traditional name, the place where the pipestone comes from. Um, I'm also a member of the Wolf Clan, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, when we talk about family, it's interesting hearing other people's point of view of family, like when Nora was saying, we're moving towards this kind of family. Actually, a lot of your description is the way our families were, uh, you know, historically, and how we engage with one another. We didn't really, separate, like we're community, maybe is a better way to describe it. Um, what I want to do is share a bit of a story with you. So what I want to do is take you out of this venue for a second. 
Um, and this is a, a January um, day. Uh, a young boy and his uncle are walking uh, on their trap line. It's one of those days when, I don't know if people feel it as much in southern Ontario, but in northern Ontario it's really crisp and snow kind of coalesces in front of you. Um, and we're, and you're, you're walking, there's a boy and, a, and his uncle are walking down a path. So as they're walking, um, uh, the boy notices something out of the corner of his eye and he sees a wolf there. And uh, he says to his uncle, uncle, there's a wolf following us. What should we do? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. Just, let's just keep walking. So they're going. Um, the wolf seems to be getting a little bit closer. So the boy says to his uncle, he's getting scared now. And he says, uh, uncle, the, the, the wolf's getting closer. What should we do? And, and they're carrying rifles. So his the thought is, well, shouldn't we shoot the wolf? And he says, don't worry about it. Wherever you are, there'll always be a wolf there following you. So that's a story from my childhood. That's how I was in, introduced to my dotum and my clan. Um, I am from the wolf clan, and what we're taught and what I was taught is that wolf clan people are leaders, teachers, and pathfinders. And my life has taken a path that has been very circular. It wasn't linear. Even though I'm an academic now, I'm really still very uncomfortable with that title. I see myself more as a community person than somebody who works to represent the community. And that's and I, uh, the way my path has gone. I never fit into school. Um, I failed out of high school. Uh, I did a number of jobs in the federal government before I started in the academic work that I'm doing. But the foundation of where I come from, and that story especially, that's where I was taught about family. My father worked away in the bush, in bush camps. So I spent a lot of my time with my uncle out on the land, uh, learning about traditional things. Now at the time I didn't realize that, right? Now when I look back and realize what that meant for me to ground me in that tradition, and that's really where I value and what I hold so dear now. Um, so when it comes to families and inclusion, I really think of it in a much broader context. It's more about community for me. Um, my academic work is in peace and conflict studies. Uh, I teach in the faculty of education, so I'm teaching teachers. I teach Aboriginal education. And it's very interesting working with students. Uh, you know, when we talk about Aboriginal people, I still think Indigenous people of Canada, there's still a misunderstanding around us. Um, it's interesting, even when we use things like Turtle Island. So Turtle Island is North America. That's what we call Turtle Island you see a lot of representations of animals, land, and what that, <clears throat> excuse me, what that means for our people. So if you think of it in terms of ceremony and the kinds of things you go through on your way to adulthood, for us as Aboriginal people, the rites of passage and the ceremonial processes we go through, that's where we form our connections and our identities. So our ceremonies, and I speak about this from an academic point of view, but also from a personal point of view, because I didn't really feel like I fit in, you know, when I was in high school. And I think that's one of the reasons why I had difficulty in school. Um, but as I got older, and people would invite me, uh, you know, uh, my first experience with Aboriginal culture was in my early 20s, and I was working in uh, Pakistan National Park as a firefighter. And a local person invited me to go to a powwow. And I'd never been to a powwow in my life because we grew up off reserve. Um, my family moved off, uh, we moved off where they created the reserve because my grandfather didn't want my, uh, my mom and her sister to go to residential school. So rather than go to residential school, he traded a cow for land in, in, in the town. So we always grew up in the town. Um, so we, uh, um, we, as I've, as I've grown, as I've experienced things, as I went through those ceremonies, what I realized, what I've come to realize, and this is where peace and conflict studies come from, peace for me is about finding out who you are and finding out your role and your path. And even though I was introduced to that when I was uh, relatively younger, um, I didn't really fully understand that until I got older. Um, as Elders in communities would invite me and say, like when I went to my first powwow, that was my first introduction to traditional ceremony. I'd never experienced it. And what happened at the powwow was um, I got very, very sad. 
And what happened was, as I heard the drum, and if you understand the symbol, the drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. So there's symbolic representation behind it. The sights, the sounds, the colors, and all the things you experience have meaning. But what I saw was my grandmother. And what I saw was myself sitting at her feet, looking up at her, and hearing her singing. And I never knew my grandmother. She passed away when I was pretty young, although my mom told me we were very close. Um, but that awoke something in me, I think. And that was my first experience with ceremony. And there's been a number of them through my life. So as I've gone through those ceremonies, it's helped me understand who I am and how I fit into my role in the Wolf Clan, what that means. Um, I didn't like school, so I didn't want to be a teacher. I flunked out of school, so I couldn't be a teacher. I ended up going back to college and doing it the long way, but I ended up a teacher, you know, because I think that's part of my clan. And, you know, I don't know what leadership means to people, but for me, trying to give a voice to people who don't have a voice is part of leadership for me. And, you know, thank you for asking me to come here because this is where we get to share and get to experience some of those things. So it sounds like what you're saying that some of your the role in the path mm -hmm. came from your family, which was the wider community. So exactly. that's something that, that you need to exactly. think about. Yeah. And when we travel, and it's been interesting, so when I was introduced to my clan, uh, I was told by an elder, it doesn't matter where you go, um, you're always going to have family because your clan is like your family. And I've traveled and worked all over the country. And it's, I, I really believe that. It's true. Mm -hmm. When you meet people from your clan, you don't talk about those things right away, of course, but you end up kind of having this extended family where you go. And I mean, those are just a couple stories, but there's been a number of stories where community people have given me gifts that have helped me when I've been having a hard time. So inviting me to ceremony, helping me reconcile some of the abuse and things mm -hmm. that happened to me and my family when, we, when I was younger, when I needed it, somebody would step forward and give me a gift. And that gift carried me through that difficult time. And so I feel like that's pay it forward kind of thing as somebody now who works with young people and tries to help people understand Aboriginal and Indigenous culture. Okay, thanks so much. That's the support you were talking about, Nora, in your word cloud. Tisa, you work in schools. So, I work in what schools. do you know? So, that's a different environment entirely, right? You're yeah. working with young children. Maybe yes. you can tell us about the ages and what those families look like and yeah. how, how you understand those families. So, bonjour, Wadje. Hello. Uh, I, amazing stories. I'm so humbled. I'm so absolutely humbled to be here. Um, and uh, it's funny, I, uh, Paul and I are both from Thunder Bay. And when we think of Thunder Bay, you think they're a small town, but we'd never met each other before. <laughs> We'd been in correspondence so through work for a couple of things, um, because he's in the faculty of education and I as a teacher. Um, and it's interesting listening to his story and how really it kind of supplements or resonates, supports, the, the story that I was going to share today. And I was thinking, well, what is, it that I, what is it that I really strongly feel that I need to share? And, um, and right now, I, I, I needed to talk a little bit more about the experience that my own personal family is going through because that really is shaping um, my understanding of what it is to be a teacher, to be an educator. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my family and talk about how it, if it weren't for my family, then I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be a teacher. I wouldn't, I, I just, I don't know where I would be. Like family is the most important thing. Um, and then Paul was also talking about how he flunked out of school. Well, isn't that funny? Like I flunked out of school. I was just telling somebody in this, right before I came up here that, you know, I hated school with a passion. I hated it so bad that I wanted to go back and become a teacher. <laughs> and, and I said, the reason I wanted to go back and become a teacher was because, um, because there were a couple of educators in my life that literally kept me alive. And, and I said, you know, at the end of the day, I don't remember who taught me how to do fractions. I don't remember who taught me how to sound out, you know, consonant vowel blends. I said, but I remember who was kind to me. 
And I think, you know, as an educator, and that's what I, in all my professional development with, with teachers, because I, I work pre uh, predominantly, our, our teacher, teacher self-identify as Italian, um, non-Indigenous. We have, uh, we have a very uh, little multicultural or Indigenous um, self-identified staff in our board, so I talked to them about that, and you just need to be kind. Because if you, if you can humble yourself enough to be kind, then you'll develop those relationships. So this is where I am from originally. So the red, oh, I lost the red dot for Thunder Bay. So just sort of right on the top of Lake Superior is um, where Thunder Bay is. Uh, there's sort of a green island underneath the, the line there that's um, Minnesota. Thunder Bay is there. The red dot at the very top is where um, my mother is from, and it's within the Treaty 9 area, the Anishinaabeaski Nation, and that is Kichinamega Zibin in Newark. So I, I spent a lot of time traveling back and forth between that area, and then the other red dot down by the Manitoba, Minnesota corner is Onigaming First Nation, and that's where my father was from. And so we, we moved back and forth constantly, and my life was pretty, pretty much a textbook, or classic, you know, residential school, family, you know, surviving family unit, just try, trying to get through day-to-day -day life. And we spent some time in Thunder Bay as well when I was a child. So I'm situating my family. So this is one of um, a picture from years ago. So my, my older girl's 17 now and my younger is 12. Um, so my older daughter is adopted, but we've had her since she was eight weeks old. And so she is absolutely our, our child. There's no... Um, no question about it. But she lives with a lot of challenges. And we knew right from uh, when we adopted her that she, she had been prenatally exposed to alcohol. And regardless of, you know, of all of that, um, we, you know, we, we, we knew that she was meant to be. There was a story behind how she came into our lives. We weren't looking to adopt. Um, and uh, so I'm like, yes, this baby just belongs with us. And so we wrapped her in intervention upon intervention and stimulation and anything and ceremony, anything that we could do to heal her little brain and her little spirit. And um, we're still really struggling. We're really struggling, 17 years old. This last week, we, you know, we've been in and out of hospital because we're looking at sa safety now um, and risk with life. And um, in the last year, we actually had to extend um, a request to the Children's Center Thunder Bay uh, to support us with uh, residential care. But there, there are no services in Thunder Bay. I mean, we lack services in general for children with, who, with complex needs. Um, but in Thunder Bay, we do not, they, they wanted to send her away to Southern Ontario. And I said, we're not sending her away. You know, this child was brought to us by our creator and, and um, and I'll talk more about that later. And so we're dealing with that. And then my 12-year-old, um, and, and this was a, a conversation that I'd had with Cheryl a couple of weeks ago. For me, I'm realizing that she is a child now of she, the intergenerational survivor piece. And uh, she doesn't have necessarily a reason to, to identify with trauma because we've surrounded her. But the other day I saw it written on her arm, hashtag survivor. I'm thinking, what are you surviving? You know, you went without data for an hour, or, you know? <laughs> like, I'm not sure, right? Like the whole Facebook family piece, right? Like, I, so, I mean, and this is, this is a moment. And then my husband and I, we have sort of colliding li li life experiences, right? Very, they contrast. So I was raised by uh, two parents who were residential school survivors. They both went to residential school. My husband was raised in this beautiful, and he said, you know, it was beautiful, his childhood. His, family, his older siblings were taken to residential school. His mom and dad never went to residential school, but by the time he was born, his family had relocated to start a new settlement in the 60s. And so he was able to avoid that, but he lived in like a one-room um, cabin with his granny there, with all of his, whatever was left of his nine siblings, some of them had married and moved on already. And he had a rabbit fur blanket. And it's amazing, and he said, I didn't know that I was without. Mm -hmm. He didn't realize that 
that would be now considered extreme poverty. You know, and they, every night they would roll out their sleeping mats. So, so um, definitely colliding um, lived experiences, but we make it work. Uh, people in my world, so my kokum and my tetanan and mamanan, and those were people that really worked hard to try and, uh, they didn't go to residential school, but they really worked hard to try and maintain some of that traditional knowledge piece and, and pass that on to the grandchildren. Um, grandmothers, so my mother is over here in this corner and my husband's mother is over there and their role and, and, and it, it's interesting, you know, all throughout like how complex families are. And, you know, my mother r really works hard at trying to be a grandmother because, uh, it, you know, she's trying to overcome some of that lived experiences uh, of having gone to residential school. And she talked to me and uh, it was about 10 years ago, I guess, and apologized to me. And she said, you know, I'm sorry that I never taught you the, the native language. She said, but she said, I really, really believed because I was told repeatedly that you would be better off if you only knew English. She said, and, and so I never wanted you to learn the language, she said, because I was so, I felt so shamed because I spoke the language. I thought that it was something so bad to have. So she's working really hard to try and you know, develop those, those skills that, are, you know, kind of we think a grandmother should have. Whereas it comes very naturally to my mother-in-law because she didn't experience that trauma in her life. So this is my 17-year-old now. She was at Aboriginal Day Powell yesterday. And, you know, it's those moments, even if it was an hour and a half, and she was there with staff, um, a support person, and just that hour and a half of her being out there, she doesn't have a disability or an exceptionality anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that brain injury or brain damage doesn't exist, and she's just out there and dancing. Um, the land, again, you take her out on the land. You know, my, my other daughter, not so much. You know, she's hashtag survivor, right? <laughs> <laughs> And it's amazing what my 17-year-old has taught me, and I'm sure we're going to get there with my 12-year-old. So we're trying to figure out what is 17-year-old um, hormones and drama and what is FASD. Mm. And then she has a developmental disability that uh, is connected to the FASD. So, but you take her out on the land, and it's incredible. Um, the language is super important for us, so I'm actually on leave next year from my work, and I thought maybe it would be time for me to do my PhD. I thought maybe, you know, when I started planning this a couple of years ago, and I realized that no, like it's all about going back and connecting with language, language and ceremony, and sort of building, you know, sort of that self-care piece, and, and that'll be my PhD. You know, being from, from Thunder Bay and working in education and working with, um, not just Indigenous students, I'm really trying to spread out, like I'm an Indigenous education resource teacher, it's not, it doesn't mean I only work with Indigenous students. I'm trying to build capacity among all students and staff um, and, and building that greater awareness, like Paul was saying, of, of what the Indigenous experience has been. Um, and Thunder Bay has had some pretty significant things happening, significant events, and you know, the, uh, recently um, we had um, a seven youth um, death inquest, and uh, it was the largest inquest in the history of Ontario, and it took place in Thunder Bay, and it was just really examining the, um, the circumstances around the deaths of, of children that moved out from areas where I am from to come and live in the city of Thunder Bay to go to high school. And um, there were seven youth, and just two of them, two, two more children died just in April. And uh, so that's nine altogether now. And um, this painting is a painting from one of those children. When I talk about kindness, and, I, and this painting is, is uh, in, in my dining room. And he, is the, he was a grade 10 student of mine in Native Studies. And he was just a quiet, calm person, you know, at the back of the room. Um, you know, leg out, cool guy, right? And, and uh, I would bug him because I wanted him to talk to me. You know, like, just give me something, anything. And, and his name was Kyle Morris, so. And uh, I'm like, oh, like, you related to Norval? And he's like, well, yeah, that's my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Like, this is incredible. And so I just, I went on that. I was just, I praised him. I'm like, do you realize how significant that family connection is for you? It was, um, uh, it, you know, about a month later in January, a really, really cold day, I noticed that he didn't have a jacket. 
I asked him what happened. He said, I got rolled on the bus and got robbed on the bus. They took his jacket and his shoes. And so he had on about 10 hoodies. So I asked him very humbly, I said, can I, can I get you a jacket? And so I went, he sure, went and got it. And, and I brought it to school the next day. And he said, could you bring it, bring it to my house? And um, so I went, took it. And, and I was a bit, you know, nervous. I didn't you know, I knew the family, but as a teacher, you, I was kind of stepping outside of, I'm like, well, then they're my cousin, I always say, right? Not their family. <laughs> Anyways, I went in, and, um, and uh, the father gave me one of his paintings, Christian Morris, who's a renowned uh, woodland artist, and Kyle gave me this painting, and it was almost exactly a year after this that he drowned in the river, and he was part of that inquest. So, and he's a child who should not have ended up in that river. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, the, the, the lived experiences of my students, of, of my own children, really determine what, what my work is mm -hmm. in our school board. Okay, thank you so much, Tisa. Wow, so we've had some, uh, heard a lot of stories here today, and thank you, you've really laid out, I think, some of the challenges that families face. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to talk about inclusion now, though, and I know, Nora, when we talked on the phone, you did talk a lot about inclusion and what does inclusion mean and how important is inclusion, and you, you use the word belonging, and of course, at Roots of Empathy, that's big for us, right? That's what we do. So can you talk a little bit about how families, when they're facing challenges, can feel included or how to foster inclusion uh, w when you have these sorts of things to think about? Well, when we were on our listening tour, we, we talked a lot about inclusion and more specifically exclusion um, and isolation. And what did it take to go from that state to one where one felt safe and secure and trusted and valued and appreciated and honored and truly welcome to the point where they felt safe enough to bring their authentic self to wherever that was. And we heard a lot from people who really described what it felt like the moment they went from feeling excluded or isolated to included. And many of them had a story about a teacher mm -hmm. or about um, somebody in the neighborhood or somebody in their family that made a connection. And we had this one young woman that talked about it. She had been, uh, her mom was 16 or 17 when she was born. She had lived all kinds of different places. And different men came and went. Then mom got married. Then mom got divorced. Then there was a stepfather. And then the, the complexity was such that she ended up with several step siblings. And the person that she connected to was one of her non-biological siblings, stepfathers. So this was a third time removed, and that was her connection. And she referred to him as her sib dad, <laughs> because there was no language for that anywhere. But it was that connection that made her feel suddenly included in society, in the family, in the household, in this complex web of, of relationships. And it was at that moment that that connection was made where she had a champion, she had somebody who believed in her, who told her she was brilliant and she was gonna be successful and she could be herself. Um, and it was a really clear example of what we continue to hear from individuals, from family units, from um, groups of people who had traveled uh, to different places together, either from another part of the world here because of work or because of um, they were fleeing somewhere or they were coming here with hopes and dreams. Um, all of that, um, I keep going back to this young woman who, who found the connection and you know, we, we've heard these stories here. These are connectors across the stage and there are connectors in this room and there are people who make a difference. And so 
for me, that's what inclusion is all about, welcoming people who they are and all that they bring. You know, I, I, one definition of family I've heard is, is family is, is two parts. One, you learn about the process of aging, and two, you learn to get along with people that don't share your interests. Mm. And that's for me, that sort of summed up inclusion in some way, shape, or form. Right, and I guess that inclusion inside the family can be moved outside well. the family, right? Because yes. we're talking about, you're talking about feeling included in your family. Yes. But we also need to talk about inclusion in our society. Yes. Um, can you talk about that, Zena? How does that, how, how, the families that you work with come here, mm -hmm. and presumably they want to feel included. Um, yeah, a lot of the time, 99% of the time when families come here, whether by choice, choosing to come to Canada or having nowhere else to come but Canada, Canada coming to this um, new country represents safety, represents um, um, acceptance, represents um, opportunity. But at the same time, the first thing and one of the first shocks that a lot of people will speak about is winter. We come from a very warm climate. Um, <laughs> in October, that's the max we have experienced. So, <laughs> so how do I? So, most of our clients hibernate. Okay, first winters, nobody goes out. Okay, just do the min bare minimum. Just do the bare minimum. Go get to your necessities and come back. And that's pretty much shapes your interaction and stages with with your host population. You just do the bare minimum. Hope for the best that you don't make a mistake or you're not, because you're not aware, you don't really understand all the nuances and the complexes. But at the same time, for a newcomer family to be included, to feel safe and, and able to participate actively and proactively is to be seen for who they really are, mm -hmm. for who I am as an individual, not who you think I should be. Whether you think I should be um, this, um, this stereotype that you hear about in the media. Um, whether be it from the school, from children in school, whether be it from parents of children in school, or um, from teachers. But at the same time, it's not, not everybody has the same story, not everybody experiences the same thing. Not all of, not every family is unique and every situation is different. Uh, to be seen for who you really are and, and who you want to be seen, not um, your poor refugee or you are a newcomer, then you don't know this, or you've never seen snow before. Some of us have seen snow before, okay? Um, so that's the thing. Um, ask the person, see who the person is, <laughs> allow for mistakes, and it's not always, um, it's not a linear experience, okay? Um, not everything is automatic. It's gonna be like, this is the step your house now, you have this, now you have that. We are expecting you to progress on this chart. It doesn't, it never happens that way. Everybody experiences it differently. People regress back and forth. It's the active support, and this is where we believe and we hope that we're actually doing this at our organization, is that that's what we support, is to, we understand that you're not gonna go on the plan that I have given you, that is mandated by my funder to give you to progress on. We're always gonna support you to come back to it or change your path wherever you wanna be. It's coming back to the same piece, see me for who I am, then I will be able to, to contribute to this, um, to this conversation as I should be. Okay, and, and Paul, you've talked about uh, family structure, Aboriginal family structure, and how that is misunderstood mm -hmm. sometimes, and you've, you also work with child welfare. Can you talk a little bit about what people need to understand or what you are hoping to share around that so that uh, that, that view is, uh, included in mm -hmm. the way we work. Yeah, I um, I think it's really you know even today's in today's day there still seems to be a real lack of understanding around Aboriginal cultures and First Nations people, um, and uh, I um, I. As, as somebody who's teaching teachers now in, in classroom, it seems so apparent to me that when people come, um, we're still failing in, in the school system and helping students understand who we are. We're very, very diverse people. And I think um, people have to understand that. Even the terms we use, like uh, you know, the name, the real traditional name of your community as opposed to Aboriginal or Indigenous and 
the legal context of all those things. Um, we're a, a very, very diverse group of people. Um, you could be, you know, kilometers apart and have two communities and they could be just like night and day, right down to, you know, different dialects of language, um, different social conditions. And you can see that across the country. So when I have students come into class uh, as future teachers, um, I have them do a, uh, a uh, the first assignment is to reflect on where their perspective comes from. And oftentimes people are just, they have, you know, they're very, I ask them to be very honest and open because like other people up here, I really believe that I have to model what I say as well. Um, saying to do something and me not doing it myself, uh, I think is, it just wouldn't work. So as, as somebody who's a professor or a teacher, I try to let my heart speak for myself. So I do share a lot of personal stories. I, I do that kind of thing. And I try to help them understand that I think the heart is the biggest tool we have as a teacher. So it doesn't matter who I'm working with. I want people to understand me for who I am inside. So, but what happens is, is that um, students say that they never had, they don't remember ever having any curriculum related to Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of people from Southern Ontario, like last year, one of my classes, probably 80, 90% of them were from Southern Ontario. And the vast majority of them had zero knowledge of Aboriginal people. Um, you know, they'd never experienced it. So what I do is I try to do that in my class. So this year, for the first time, I had them actually go to a powwow because I remembered what that did for me. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to say, well, I'll try to help them do that. And it was amazing. You know, we did a sharing circle when the day after the weekend when they were supposed to go. And some of them, it was transformational for them. They would never saw that side of Aboriginal culture because you always hear the negative things. Mm -hmm. You don't really get to see the positive. And what I found and learned about my culture and community is that we are so loving and so caring, and I try to help people understand that. Um, you know, when you need help, uh, like when Europeans first came here, you know, our people help people survive. You know, we've been part of the history of Canada. We do the same thing now. Um, when you go to a community, the things you see in the media, the things that are, are, are seem to be predominant stories about us, they're just not accurate from my experience. Um, so uh, when we talk about inclusion, when we talk about all those kinds of things, I, I feel like my experiences teach me that my culture is a very inclusive culture. We live it, our ceremonies are part of it. We invite people in, and I tell my students that, you know, when they go to the Pawa, I told them, when you go there, you're probably gonna see little kids running around and it's probably gonna freak you out a little bit because you're gonna think, oh my God, who's watching those kids? They're gonna get in trouble. And I tell them, everybody watches kids. When you go to powwow, everybody's looking out for those kids. It's not like they're running around. The parents are doing things, but everybody plays a role in the safety of the community. And to me, all that, all that is part of it. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really, you know, and again, I didn't grow up in traditional culture. I think, I feel like, and I think my mom would probably say this now, and my mom was an Ojibwe language teacher. Um, she helps me lots with the Ojibwe language, but I think she would say that it wasn't a very popular thing to be Aboriginal, and I think underlying some things now is that still is there. I think kids feel that. I'm going through that with my kids now. I don't look native. My kids don't look native. And when they say they're native, all the kids are like, you're not native, you don't have brown skin, you don't wear feathers in here, you don't do this, you don't do that. But I've tried really hard to make them proud of being, you know, help them understand. So they've gone to ceremony, they have their spirit names, they've gone through some of those rites of passage, and yet even after that, they still, I think, it, I still think it's negative, mm -hmm. you know, because of the media and stuff. So, so what do you think families need today to feel included and to feel uh, that there's some sense of cohesion in their sense of family because we've heard how important it is. What do families need, Tisa? Oh my goodness. Um, that's a big question. I know. Think of a couple of things. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. What, do, what do families need? I think that um, families, families need um, support to heal. 
I think that we have inadequate resources um, that will support, in the Indigenous community in particular, um, inadequate resources to support um, families to overcome. We were having this conversation mm -hmm. about how all of, our, all of our homes would fail child welfare standards because there's wood stoves, you know, you lack plumbing, lack clean drinking water. So technically all of our children would, be, would have to be apprehended by children's aid. And so what, what infrastructure do we need to put in place um, to ensure that our indigenous children, mm -hmm. you know, they have equitable opportunity. Um, um, I'm thinking a little bit about, um, you know, what Zena was saying about the, how uh, they're so diverse and, you know, we have that, that same experience as indigenous people with the whole pan-Indian, um, concept and then also teachers really struggle with the uh, the teachers I work with they they include the indigenous people in with the multicultural population and they're very distinct lived experiences you know multicultural people who are newcomers come here um, to escape we didn't have any place to escape to and, and this was it, we just had no choice. And so I think that the understanding from Canada, like Paul had said, from the general public mm -hmm. to, to understand that we, we didn't ask to live with all of the negative statistics. We didn't like, but then that there's incredible resilience. And, and you know, there's a lot of grit there. Um, our ceremony still exists. Um, one of the pictures of my Tetanon, mm -hmm. um, an elderly man, my great-grandfather, he used to hide his ceremonial items out on an island, and he used to paddle out in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and, and go and sing his songs. And, you know, so we, we're there, the, uh, you know, for, for Canada and, and educators and, and, you know, other newcomers to know that, that um, Indigenous peoples that, you know, the, there is this history of, of trauma, um, but there's also incredible, uh, you know, perseverance. Um, and that it, it's, it's really about that, that education piece. Nora? I, I think we've got, you know, 150 years worth of history in this country. And we did a lot of doing to people residential schools being a good example of that. We did two. Um, and then we realized that wasn't so good, and then we figured out we're gonna do four people. So we're gonna give them a house, and it's gonna be our definition of what a house should look like and what it should include and create these rules. And So we started doing two, then we did four. And then we thought we were really smart, and we said, okay, we're gonna do with. So we're gonna do collaboration and we're gonna listen and we're gonna consult and, and, and then we're gonna act. And I think we need to completely rethink that and go from doing to being. And we need to be respectful, we need to be honoring, we need to be attentive, we need to be supportive, we need to, to really learn how to be good listeners and to really understand the experiences, the perspectives and not make assumptions about what anybody needs or may want or may benefit from, but rather what can we offer in terms of an environment or a space to really listen and learn and understand and grow. And instead of doing two, for or with, what can we learn from each other? And what can we offer? And how can we find the best of the best? And you said, you know, this is the way you've lived all along. Well, there's other neighborhoods that are trying to learn how to do that communal living. You know, co-housing is like a big conversation across the country. How do we do this? Well, guess what? We have indigenous peoples whose culture is based around the concept of what we now call co-housing. Yeah. And they think they've invented this concept. <laughs> and, and, and so there's a lot that we can do by shifting from a, a, a place of doing to a place of being. And, and what is the impact on the family 
and on children, if we can do that, what happens? I think we get to all the belonging and the and this sense of worth and the sense of value and and feeling appreciated and and really feeling like people can be their whole selves without a label, without a um, having to express just a, an identity to get recognized. But we're all human beings, and we all want and need biologically and emotionally and socially need relationships. And we need somebody to believe in and something to believe in, and we need somebody to believe in us. Mm -hmm. And you create that, we will all thrive, whether you're dealing with a, a, a prenatal experience of alcohol or you know, just a community coming together or reconstituting of relationships, it's, it, it can be huge. Mm -hmm. and I have to echo what I heard from, um, from the panelists, is, is to be recognized for who you are and not be held to one strict standard. Mm -hmm. um, to be, for, for the longest time, um, the newcomer community has measured success of integration of how well can you fit in undetected, mm -hmm. un unrecognized as a newcomer, mm -hmm. and recognized as a person of color. How well that is success of integration. That really isn't. Mm -hmm. Because for families to thrive, um, a child who goes to school should not be feeling ashamed of mom's accent should not feel uh, worried that dad's gonna come pick me up and my kids, my, my friends are gonna see it. It's not only enough to say we're accepting, but um, not everybody should be held to the same exact standard. Like you said, all homes are gonna fail mm -hmm. if you hold it to this one sheet. Um, talk about communal housing, it was very normal to live in a household where I came from, where you have your uncles and your aunts living in this, it wasn't, it was indifferent and it wasn't, for example, one of the hardest things that we faced in the last two years is housing the newcomers because you're looking at a family that has six children or eight children and regulation says you cannot, nobody is gonna rent you with that amount yeah. of children. Yeah. So it is not, yes, it's not only ex enough to say, yeah, we're accepting and everything, mm -hmm. but let's not hold everybody to the same standard. Let's understand what everybody sees as fitting for their own unit. Okay, thank you guys very much. I'm gonna open it up to questions. We have a few minutes left, so I wanna make sure. Yes. Okay, um, so when you use those terms, first off, they're very uh, controversial. So um, depending on what context you're in, you might use them differently. So Aboriginal is the actual legal name of people, Indigenous peoples in Canada. So there's three Aboriginal groups under the Constitution, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So those are the three that are recognized legally. As you break those terms down though, you have status, non-status, okay. different rights for different people. Um, the term Indigenous now is typically used, I think, in a, more in an international context. So, uh, especially with the declaration, the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, I think there's a recognition, and it seems to be more in the last maybe five to 10 years kind of thing. I think with the UN Declaration, Indigenous peoples around the world are understanding and realizing that we have connections with one another. Most of us have colonial history. Um, so I think there's a recognition somehow that there's some similarities so typically what happens is that when I talk and when I talk to my students, I try to help them understand that, you know, most local groups will have their own way of describing themselves. Um, so just like saying the name for KI up north, I won't try to say it. Yeah. Or for me, uh, Opaganistaning or the Red Rock Indian Band, like Indian is a derogatory term. Most people won't use it. But for us, we are known as the Red Rock Indian Band and it's almost, uh, it's almost uh, resistance to take control of that term and say, this is who we are. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's very complicated. What I try to tell uh, teachers uh, when I have them in class is 
don't think you have to know everything and that you can't make mistakes. If you use a term and somebody's offended by it, and I've had to learn this the hard way too, because even though I am First Nations, I'm a status Indian, and I've worked all over the country, every time I go someplace new, I have to learn about the local people that I've worked with um, and how they like to be described and how they call themselves. So I try to help the students understand that depending on where you want to teach, there might be slight variances to how people might want to be recognized. And the big thing again, and I think it's a term about inclusion, um, my thesis is called Kin Omadawad Megwad Dodamawad. And it translates as they are learning with each other, uh, they are learning with each other while they are doing. And the idea is that when we bring people together um, with no power you know, between us, but we just come together as humans, um, human beings, um, we can learn. And by learning with each other, and truly learning from one another, then um, we can learn to coexist better. Um, and so when it comes to those terms, and I always tell people that, if you go to work with an Aboriginal community, and I've had to learn that the hard way too, and I've gotten in trouble with some local groups for some of the terms I've used and things like that, I just sincerely say sorry, I didn't know, and I, I promise you I'll never do it again, and, and I just try to move forward from there. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm not sure if everyone was able to hear that question, but it was a question about the, universe, uh, the uh, universal income and how that might impact families. Who would like to answer that question? Was it for somebody specific? Anybody? OK. Well, the, the research shows that uh, a basic income level across the community will level the playing field for many individuals and families and households in the community. That once you take care of the basics, the needs, the, and give people the power to make their own purchasing decisions, instead of saying, oh, you're low income, we're gonna give you subsistence, subs, subs, Subsistence. Thank you. Um, resources. And then we're going to tell you you have to live here and you have to get a job and there's minimal public transit that goes to those outskirts or to those communities or they're over full and over packed or whatever. By providing a basic income, minimum income for everybody, what the research shows is that people have an opportunity to make decisions they can make mistakes, they can take advantage of opportunities, they feel empowered, um, they can begin to become autonomous over their own futures, as opposed to just coping with the bare minimum and having to um, try to survive as opposed to thrive. And, you know, it's, it's what all, and it is worldwide. I mean, this is a, a concept that's being studied very carefully by economists, by um, conservatives, by Democrats, by uh, socialists all around the world. And the results are very consistent, and the resistance is very strong. Uh, any other questions? We have a couple of minutes left, if anybody, yes? Have we made progress? Any of you can answer, but in terms of families and from child, from child yeah. Yes. Has there, has there been a difference yeah. from the time when you were children? Absolutely. Do you feel that families are I, thriving better? You know, when I think of, um, you know, the, 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 the trauma that happened in my home when I was a child and, and how, I've been able to move beyond that, and my husband and I are creating a much safer space for our, our daughter. But what's really interesting, though, is that she wants to identify as being Anishinaabe. And so she wants to have Anishinaabe friends. But a lot of her friends are caught up in that cycle of, of poverty still. You know, it, it's a big school that she's in, and the group of really kind, gentle kids. 
And so she's actually almost appropriating their stories. And so I, I've had to have some, some very different, you know, uh, they're very courageous conversations with her about how you don't need to be in crisis like that. Like you can go and be a support. So it is, it is changing. We are moving forward. And especially as, a, as an educator in my board, I'm seeing so much progress and, and engagement from teachers. Um, last week I had voluntary uh, professional development and it was overwhelming and I only kept it down to 20, but the, 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 the demand for it is, is um, it, it warms my heart. Uh, really good. Yeah. What about you, Zina? Are you seeing any changes in the way people are feeling when they uh, come here? Um, I came here uh, 26 years old, so I don't really have a reference to, I haven't been in formal schooling in Canada. I don't have children, but my, what I'm seeing from the clients that we serve, from the, my colleagues and my friends who are here, um, like I said before, before it used to be in the first five years that I've was in Canada, is that everything is to the same standard. Let's blend in, let's not show who we are. Um, I'm looking at the same children that I've seen at five years old now, almost at university, and it's this, I am here, I am visible, and I am, I am who I am, and I have something to say, and I have something to contribute. In my work that I have seen in the last 10 years that I worked, school systems were very resistant to accepting anything outside. Um, I think what happened with the, with the world refugee crisis and, and the Syrians were the poster child for it, unfortunately, is that it brought attention to the outside world, to the, what others are going through. And it was a very refreshing experience for the first time in my life, 10 years working in the sector. That was the first time that school boards came to us and said, give us some cultural context. Show, like, just give us anything that just come and, and answer our questions. It's okay not to have the answer because what my experience is as somebody who was born in Iraq, lived across the Middle East, and then came here as an adult with a degree is completely different than the child you're gonna be working with. It's completely different than the uh, teenager you're gonna be working with who came from a privileged background who ended up in here. Just the, the, the openness and the willingness to actually engage in conversation is something that we view as very refreshing. And it's not only for school, um, for school systems, it's formal um, other service providers, everybody. And I think it's, it's, it's an awakening for, for, for the entire um, Canadian population for, in my perspective is that now we're recognizing that newcomers are gonna continue coming, mm -hmm. okay? Um, trying to fit them in the mold is not gonna work. Okay, because they're going to continue coming. Let's have this openness in this conversation. So this is what I have been seeing, and and it could be my own my my personal experience working in the same organization for ten years that I've seen more of a progress, but in reaction to the waves and waves of refugees and skilled workers. Okay, it does give you a perspective though when you've been in one place yes. for a while. Uh, Paul and then Nora. Mm -hmm. I'm I. Um... That's a really complicated question um, because I'm not sure if the, like it's a linear where we set an objective and we move that forward. I think it's a little more cyclical than that. We take two steps forward, we go three steps back, we take a step forward, we take two, you know, it's kind of like this kind of learning dynamic. Um, I often think sometimes that by, by thinking we can set objectives, we might oversimplify and find try to find solutions, but I'm not sure if we know if there's a solution. You know, so that's this idea with learning with each other while we are doing, we just need to learn and just live and love one another. You know, it's a simple, silly thing, but it really makes a lot of sense. And I think that's what I've experienced, what made me feel comfortable is fe feeling that love from those individuals who helped me along that path and then helped me get to the point where I could feel comfortable. So I, I really, we have to be careful, I think, not to simplify things because it's a very complicated endeavor that we're on. Right. We're talking about history, cultures coming together, mm -hmm. but it's also wonderful opportunity. Right. You know, and, and I think that's what I love about Canada. That's what I love about my community is those differences 
and yet we can still come together. We can still sit in places here and dialogue and mm -hmm. have conversations and try to learn from mm -hmm. each other. I think, you know, and I have been accused of, of being positive. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think we've made enormous progress, um, particularly for um, women. Um, I, I think about my grandmother when she was in the paid labor force and becoming, became engaged to be married. She was escorted off the property and given a silver tea set. When my mother became engaged and got married, that was fine. The day she became visibly pregnant with her first child, she was escorted off the property and given a silver tea set. When I had my first, I worked right up to the day my water broke. Um, when my son became a dad, he took paternity leave. When today's boomers in this country were born, life expectancy for men was 63. That's why retirement age was set at 65. <laughs> I work right up to the end. Women lived to 68 when they were born. They're now turning 65, and their life expectancy is another 25 to 30 years relative male-female. That's huge gains in terms of opportunity. We have the lowest teen pregnancy rates in this country. We have more women becoming moms for the first time over the age of 40. We have more centenarians than ever before. We have opportunities to have conversations and dialogues that would not have happened even 20 years ago. We have opportunities with technology. Yesterday, Google un released the overlay of indigenous lands. So we can now all acknowledge the traditional territory wherever we happen to be by looking at Google Maps. That's a huge gain of awareness. And I believe that the next generation the kids who have come through these schools, the kids that are being raised by these parents, we're in good hands. Look at these kids who are going through roots of empathy. Look at the kids who are being asked today, what's the difference between you and your friend? And from our perspective, well, she's in a wheelchair and she's not. He's black, he's white. And what do these kids say? She likes lettuce, I don't. <laughs> You know, they don't see the same thing. I think we're in good hands. I think we've made enormous progress. We still have a lot of work to do, but I do think the momentum is going in the right direction. Thank you very much, Nora. That is an excellent note to end on. Did you plan that? Thanks. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of you coming here tonight and sharing, I mean, you, your perspectives, your experiences, your personal stories, and the stories from the people you've heard. So thank you very much. Thank you.